hello, hello. Welcome, welcome back. It's Sarah from Roadworthy. Um, there is a bird that's very loud. There he is. I'm hoping he's not too annoying in this video, but spring, people, what can you do? Uh, let's see. What's been happening? So, Harry, the foster dog, my foster greyhound, uh, has a home. So later today, I will be uh, rendezvousing with his new owner to hand him off. Uh, so that's fantastic. Um, he He's going to a home um, in in a in a rural place um and he's i hear i see him <laughs> in the window right here lifting the curtain um anyway he's going to a, a rural location with a big fenced yard uh and another greyhound so i took him up there last week maybe uh, to to visit to make sure he got along with the other greyhound and it was just so wonderful to see them running around and tearing it up in the yard um, so I think I think he'll be really really happy uh, where he's going so that is fantastic and last week I mentioned it is my nephew's wedding uh, this week. So last night was the rehearsal dinner, um, which uh, had, a, had a theme. It was a Western theme. <laughs> um, we had barbecue, which was delicious. Um, and then we had uh, line dancing for entertainment, which, um, have any of us line danced? M maybe five, <laughs> you know, like no is the answer. Um, and the, the bride is French. And so probably, I don't know, 12 or 15 of her relatives from France have come over and it was kind of perfect because nobody knew what they were doing. And so they felt comfortable joining right in. So it was great. I mean, of like the bride and groom's generation, I think nearly everybody participated. And then I think of my generation, probably three quarters of us were on there on the floor and it was hilarious. I mean, like total, you know, bumping into people like, turning and you know going in the wrong direction i mean it was like you you the comedy was high uh but we were all i'm laughing and sweating up a storm and having a good old time so it was it was great it was a lot of fun um and so uh wedding tonight so uh, yeah i've been saying round two is tonight um so I feel like there's just been a lot going on. And so I thought not a ton of reading has happened, but actually that's not really true. So what have I been doing? Um, so I finished uh, the, end, the, the world at the end of the cul-de-sac. Uh, the world is the end of a cul-de-sac. Oh my God, by Louise Kennedy. I'll put the cover here with the right title. Um, this was, I'm surprised this book hasn't gotten more attention. Um, Louise Kennedy's uh, debut, Trespasses, um, I enjoyed a lot and had gotten a lot of critical attention. And so... Uh, this is her debut short story collection, and I, I, I've actually haven't really seen anything about it on BookTube, um, but I, I really liked this collection. Um, a lot of these stories are about women on the fringe or experiencing isolation in some way. 
So maybe geographically, right, they live in a, in a rural community or on a farm. Um, socially, maybe they're on the fringe of a friend group. Um, many marriages not going well in this collection. Um, economically, many of these women are, um, are challenged in some way. So um, I found all these stories maybe a bit unsettling, tense. There, many of them had like a menacing quality or you felt this like potential for violence. Um, there was often sort of one sentence in there that change your whole perception of events or characters. Um, so I love that sort of like zinger twist uh, in the story. So I really, really enjoyed this collection and, and thought it was great. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping to see more people talk about it. Um, then um, a nonfiction choice that I read was um, Cobalt Red, How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives by Siddharth Kara. Um, I didn't think this would fit for people, April, but I think actually it kind of does and fits in as, uh, you know, potentially a group biography. Um, talking about the lives of what are called artisanal miners in the Congo. These are basically extremely poor people who are mining for cobalt using hands and shovels and, you know, maybe a pickaxe kind of a thing. Um, this book is really an, a thorough expose of the cobalt supply chain. And he really goes through to talk about how illegally mined and this artisanally mined cobalt is uh, frankly laundered and uh, entered into the um, legitimate supply chain of cobalt. And Kara definitely has an agenda in this book. Um, I mean, really, he is wanting to shame um, all the manufacturers of you know, lithium ion batteries, all the manufacturers um, that have products that use rechargeable batteries. So we're talking, you know, phones, laptops, tablets, um, e-readers, uh, and electronic vehicles, um, or excuse me, electric vehicles. Um, that all of them have these proclamations that they support, you know, labor laws and, you know, international standards and their cobalt is sourced ethically. And he is basically writing this book to say bullshit and, um, and he, it's a very detailed a very thorough, exhaustive um, account of his journeys throughout the mining region of the Congo. Um, and it often feels repetitive because he'll go from one mining area to another, to another, to another. And oftentimes the story is very much the same or has slight variation, but I think he wants to make sure that no manufacturer come back can come back and say, well, we require acquire our cobalt from this mine and you didn't document any issues there. So therefore, you know, we're good. Um, 
so he talks about child labor. Um, the vast majority of these mines have the whole family is employed. Um, in the mining region, there are virtually no schools, um, no health care. Um, so again, many of these families are forced to employ their children. Um, there, in some places, there is human trafficking happening because these mining areas don't necessarily have arable land or clean water. Um, so no one would choose to live there. Um, so yes, human trafficking. Um, he goes through sort of the environmental impacts um, that environmental laws are, are being ignored. Uh, public health issues experienced by many of these mining communities that state, safety standards aren't really adhered to or followed in any way, um, and, and corruption. Um, the corruption of uh, the Congolese government, um, and a lot of the history too. So he talks about the history of, of um, uh, resource extraction corruption and exploitation that uh, that has been occurring um, since you know King Leopold's time right when he he when the Congo was his property um, right up through the present and talking about how many of the practices that King Leopold set up are pretty much still in place. Um, a lot of the, the structures in, in um, systems that he put in place for extracting maximum profit um, exist there today. He talks a lot about how there's a lot of middlemen um, who are all, you know, taking a slice of the profit. But again, this is how Apple, Samsung, Tesla, Chrysler, Daimler, Daimler Chrysler, you know, all of these Google, you know, all of these manufacturers can say their cobalt is clean because you, it's very difficult to actually trace where cobalt has come from, where it was mined, and who mined it. Um, so, and he talks about too that that um, many many of the mines are Chinese owned, um, and you know some have Congolese partnerships, um, but how many of these places knowingly uh, launder cobalt um, to allow you know, these corporations to proclaim their innocence. Um, so it was enlightening, but again, it felt very repetitive. Um, and I, I frankly, about halfway through started like, because it was like, okay, this is kind of more of the same. Um, definitely an important book, but like I said, he, he definitely has an agenda. I finished Trash um, by Sylvia Aguilar Zeleni, and this is translated by J.D. Plukar. Um, this was for Trans Girl April, um, and this is a book with three alternating storylines. So we have Alicia, who is sort of abandoned by her family and ends up um, living in the dump in Juarez um, to, to survive. Um, so that's her point of view. And then we have um, a researcher um, who is investigating 
the, I'm guessing they're sort of an anthropologist, sociologist, you know, um, uh, doctor, uh, investigating and exploring the lives of people who live in the dock. So they're frequently um, interviewing Alicia as well as other residents. And then the third perspective is Lorena. Um, and she is a, um, a sex worker near the dump who is, um, she's sort of the uh, matriarch, I guess I would say, of a group of, of prostitutes in the area, some of whom are transgendered, some not. Um, and in her section, it's written in the second person and is written like she's giving you, the reader, an orientation to your new job as a sex worker. So it's like, you do this, you do that, you know, oh, honey, we need to work on your outfits, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and through that orientation, you sort of get snippets about her life um, and uh, a little bit about sort of her journey as a transgendered person. For me, her sections were definitely the most fun because she is sassy and brass but um, but I just thought it was really clever how Zelani threw, you know, her, her orientation could really convey um, some of the, the challenges and, and hardships and issues um, surrounding a transgendered people, but also sex workers, um, poverty. So, so though, though I have to admit that storyline was definitely the most appealing for me. Um, and all three of these storylines sort of come together towards the end. Um, a lot of this it, book is a, really about abandonment, trash, <laughs> uh, in its many definitions. So obviously not only physical trash in the dump, but also trash is in who's trashy, um, who, who's, who can be thrown away. Um, so that was interesting. And, and there was definitely gendered violence in this book too. Um, so I, I, en I enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, I think it's sort of a three and a half star kind of a, kind of a book for me. Um, but, um, yeah, I for sure enjoyed it. Um, so that is what I read this week. I am reading In the Country by Kai Thomas, finally. This has been on my radar for a very long time since it was published here in the United States, and I'm finally getting around to it. Um, I think it was long listed for the British Republic of Consciousness Prize. And I, I think that's sort of what prompted me to finally get to it. Um, I am also um, nearly done with Margaret McPherson's memoir, Tracking the Caribou Queen, um, a memoir of a settler girlhood. Um, so McPherson was, is growing up in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. So this is for People April. I'm just about done. And this is a buddy read with Lindy over at Magpie Reads. 
Um, and then I'm, I also picked up uh, Monkey Grip by Helen Garner. I, this, I'm barely into this and I'm, I, I'm reading this with my friend Lori um, and had to tell her wedding activities are way into, <laughs> are knocking my reading back. Uh, I'm supposed to be halfway done. So, sorry, Lori. Uh, so that's, that's what I got going on. I am, uh, what else? Oh, 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 gray in May. Uh, voting is wrapping up. So I'm imagining um, at some point this week, Sarah will announce the, Sarah over at Eyes on Indie, will announce the five group read choices. Um, and what else? I think that's it. Ooh, the sun, the sun. Oh my God, the sun. Ah! <laughs> um, I hope you all are reading some good things. Lots of different April reading events going on. So it's been fun watching all the things that people are, are participating in and what they're reading. Um, and, you know, I'm excited for the next thing. You know, always excited for the next new shiny thing. Um, catch up with you all next week. <laughs>